Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as always, I want to start with any questions you might have about the new homework. Did you have a chance to check it out? How does it look to you? Yes, please. It's a bottle of new challenge elements. They're from the code functions. We're supposed to return two parts of written elements, and one is the prediction, and I don't know what is the about the another one. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't I, I don't follow. Let, let, let's maybe uh, just to take a step back. Um, you're saying there are two parts. Um, I, I'm not I'm not sure what are you referring to, like the uh, part one and part two in the homework. Uh, I mean the, the, the functions. Okay. Yeah, we are two things from the whole function. Okay. Yeah, one is prediction, and I don't know what is the other one. Um, I don't know what are you referring to. So let's maybe open the homework. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, I don't I, I don't remember what are you referring to as I just remember you need to reach a certain accuracies on the task. So uh, I'm just gonna check the I think um uh, it's on the homework code, not on the description. Okay. Um maybe this is a detailed question. So maybe after the lecture we can look into that because I don't remember what exactly you should be returning in the code itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Then, um, yeah, so today I want to start with um, a slight possibility digression uh, from the instruction fine tuning, uh, but I want to also kind of demo uh, how to go about uh, training, fine tuning a pre trained model for classification, but in a sequence to sequence setup, which is generation of actual labels like positive and negative rather than adding extra parameters to the output layer to predict the classes. So we are going to use that output metrics that was used during the pre-training, which is of the size dimension, hidden dimension times a number of uh, words in the vocabulary. And that's how we had um, how we could use T5. You can use T5 in other decoder or encoder uh, decoder model, both is uh, if you want to do classification, you can add extra parameters like you did for encoder only birth models, or you can do this sequence to sequence setup. So you have two, uh, two options. All right, so let's go see how that works. All righty, let me just check whether um, change run time. Okay, this is good. All right, so. We are going to fine tune a flan T5 model for sentiment classification as sequence to sequence model. Now in, um, remember flan T5 is a model that has been instruction fine tune. I will, I will go over instruction fine tuning like a recap again, but that was the second stage of pre-training where we actually fine tune the model with label data in a sequence to sequence fashion to uh, you know follow the instructions such as, we will see an example. Um, I could have used T5 here, but later on today in the lecture, I also want to go over like prompting. So just for the easiness of demonstration, I use Plan T5 both for, uh, for both parts of what I want to demo today. Um, but you could have, you know, you would just change from Plan T5 to T5, and that would be the only uh, line of the code you would, uh, you would change. All right, so we have the same setup. We are installing the same uh thing let me just see whether this is gonna work all right team uh loading and pre-processing is almost the same as we uh as uh when we did the the Berta classification uh so you are going to use uh from data sets you are going to load the data set uh, SST2 is the data set we are working. Our next step is to do tokenization. And the important part is to, again, um, give a name of the model you want uh, the tokenizer of, uh, because tokenizers are not shared between pre-trained models. So you need to load a tokenizer for Flenty5. And here I'm using Flenty5 small. Um, and 
and everything else is basically the same. The vocabulary size is 32,000, smaller than the Bertas. And what has changed is our pre-processing function, but it's only slightly. Remember, we defined the pre-processing function to basically tokenize uh, every example in our data. And here we are going to tokenize as well, but we also want to turn every single label, which is current numerical, zero for negative, one for positive, into a string, positive, negative, because we are doing sequence to sequence approach, meaning we are generating a, a token. And that token should be either positive or negative, and then we are going to compare to uh, to the uh, human written labels. So um, basically what we are doing here is converting integer labels to text labels. That's, that's what we are doing. And um, we have also here, um, we have padded our tokens. And to prevent that the uh, loss computation creeps onto the padded tokens, we, we do extra pre-processing uh, as well over here. Uh, basically, if you add minus uh, 100, uh, that, that's going to cause Torch to ignore that particular token. If you look into the Torch's uh, implementation or documentation of loss functions, you will see that they always use minus 100 to basically signal ignore this for the computation. So the 100 here is not uh, arbitrary. It's actually intentional and follows Torch's uh, uh, approach. So that's basically what we do here. Are there any questions? I mean, the the the, the important part is understanding that we are com converting numerical labels into into strings. That's what we need to do with the sequence to sequence approach, which we didn't need to do when we did uh, when we added new weights uh, for the uh, uh, the Berta model. Yes, please. We can use uh, zero and one as strings also. Sorry, second. Like zero and one as string instead of one and two. Uh, zero and one S. Uh, actual words, yeah, positive or negative. Uh, you could use whatever token you like. Uh, when you work with pre-trained language models, because they have been pre-trained on actual natural language, you want to keep things in a natural language. If you're fine-tuning the model, the model will pick on uh, you, you, your label space is like, I don't know, cat and cow, or the, this is a reference to positive and negative. It's going to start out within just those two words. But because idea is that during pre-training model had already acquired somehow some of the abilities to do sentiment classification for some reason, because on the internet, people comment on this is a positive, negative uh, piece of text. You want to keep things as natural as possible. And that's the idea behind prompt engineering, uh, right? Like you're trying to find these phrasings that might, you know, be connected to something that's written on the web to kind of remind the model. So you could totally do what you did describe if you are fine tuning. But if you're not fine tuning the model and you're just doing in context learning, uh, then um, I don't advise that. It's likely not going to work. OK, so we did that. Great. Uh, remember, we need to actually encode, uh, tokenize, and do this uh, extra pre-processing step for every example. We use the map function. Things go super fastly. We are very happy. And now we come to the fine tuning point. Re remember last time we have used this auto model for sequence classification. And remember this, you could still use this with Flanty5 or other decoder or encoder decoder only model. What will happen is uh, in, the, in the hugging faces background, the output matrix is going to be ignored. Uh, new set of weights are going to be introduced, and these weights are going to be fine-tuned. Uh, but with uh, these uh, models that were pre-trained with the next word prediction, we have an option to also approach the problem as a sequence to sequence, which we did not have if the model was pre-trained with the mask language modeling objective and uh, if it was encoder-only model. So you have these two choices. Which one is better? Uh, if you are fine-tuning, I don't think we have a priori uh, knowledge of which one would be better. Um, but uh, these days, we kind of stick with this sequence-to-sequence -sequence approach because we don't do a ton of fine-tuning. Um, so just to demo how you would then go and use auto model for sequence to sequence model, you will import that class. Everything else stays the same. You are loading your checkpoint, which is uh, a small small checkpoint uh, here. And uh, remember, we needed to pass two things to the trainer, uh, to the trainer class. These were training arguments. 
and we needed to pass the uh, metric for the computation, which was accuracy. Things are going to get slightly different here. We are going to still use the same training arguments as before. This didn't change. Um, however, our metric for computing accuracy slightly slightly changed because uh, we need to ignore those padding uh, tokens, and we need to, um, if we want to, um, uh, maybe go back to the numerical scores, we are going to uh, return from strings to numbers. But more or less, it's it's kind of the same. You know, you're calculating accuracy, you're comparing whether two things are the same, the predicted thing and a human, human annotated label. So that's more or less the same. And now uh, when you're using sequence to sequence approach, there is a special trainer for you implemented already in Hugging Face called Sequence to Sequence Trainer. So now you're not importing the trainer class, you're importing Sequence to Sequence Trainer. That's important difference. And you will also need the class generation config, which basically takes all the generation specific configuration for that pre-trained model and you get it. And then you can change things if you like, but you at least get a, these are what the original authors have used for their hyperparameters and you can start with that. So you can import both of these. I mean, you must import sequence and sequence trainer um, and you have this uh, generation config as well. And uh, the way you use sequence to sequence trainer is exactly the same as you use your old trainer. Um, you just pass the model training arguments, training evaluation, validation data sets that are tokenized pre-process, your tokenizer for extra pre-processing steps that are done in the background and your and your uh, evaluation metric. So that stays the same. And now once you have your trainer, our favorite, the simplest command we have is trainer.train, where now uh, you are actually training your model with the default optimizer, which is Adam. Super simple, right? Um, that we made minimal changes of code, but you do need to be aware of these slight differences, uh, extra pre-processing steps and sequence to uh, sequence uh, trainer. Okay, so this is very slow and we'll leave it be. Probably not gonna finish. I, I, I feel like I'm not using GPU really uh, right now. It should be way faster. Um, so that's it. That's how you fine tune a sequence to sequence model. Are there any questions about this? Are you happy about it? Is it looks easy? You should be more excited. It's very simple uh, and you don't need to code much, which uh, you know uh, really speeds up your uh, experiments. Okay, um, then if there are no questions, we can move forward. And what I wanna do, I will come back to this uh, notebook, um, and, but I do wanna go over instruction fine tuning again. When we finished uh, last uh, last time, um, there were some questions that clarified to me that some things weren't really explained uh, very well. So let's go over a few things. So we, first of all, we said that now what we are talking about is how this pre-training stage has uh, become more involved. Before people, organizations that pre-train their model using only the next word, next token prediction, and that's still to this day, the first stage. It's not like we eliminated it, we build on it. So that's always gonna be the first stage. But now we have these two extra stages and the second stage is so-called instruction fine tuning. Important with instruction fine tuning is that we do change the model uh, weights. So um, during that stage of pre-training, we are we are forming these instances in a different way. And at the inference time, we don't change the weights, uh, but uh, during the instruction fine tuning, uh, we are. So whenever you read the word fine tuning, that means that the model weights are being changed. It's always the case. And uh, in our timeline, we have now uh, uh, come to the basically 2022 era. Um, I mean, last time what we talked about is was 2020, uh, 2020 to 2022, the idea of in-context learning, giving those few examples in the context and then prompting the model, that was proposed in 2020, but the idea to do the second stage of free training happened in 2022. So we are getting really close to, to the current timeline. Okay, going over the example, we said that um, this is an example of a prompt, prompt may, First of all, I want to make it clear that definition of a prompt is not 
there isn't a single definition. I'm giving you ma something, a definition of a prompt that people commonly use, but you will see the variations. Specifically, I here say you have an instruction, an evaluation instance, uh, that's a prompt. But even if you didn't have an instruct, uh, instruction and you just have some example and you somehow suggested to the model what to do, that would be a prompt. So there are always going to be variations. It's, that's always the case that instruction, that there might be the format like this. Uh, we call this a zero shot prompting and we call this zero shot because no training examples were used here. So zero training examples, zero shot, because shot is also another um, word term we use for training example. So this is a zero shot prompt and um, I'm gonna go back to my, um, this thing, I'm gonna stop this training because it's gonna take forever. You can try it uh, yourself uh, and actually train it. So with the prompting, uh, first of all, we again need to load our model and we need to have appropriate tokenizer. Here, I'm going to use Flenty5. Again, I'm going to increase the size to large because the um, larger sizes are, uh, of the model are generally better at doing these things where you don't fine tune them and you want to get some you know, good answer out of them. So I'm using T5 large, I tried Excel, which is 3 billion version and everything crashed. So I think this is at most we can uh, load in this thing. And all of this is um, the same as before in terms of loading the tokenizer and the model. You can see how the large version now is uh, has the size of three gigabytes. And then if you go farther and use the 3 billion version, it's going to have over 10 gigabytes. So the larger these models, their, their actual size of just downloading the weights also becomes a larger too, which is why GPU memory is important. Um, you will put this, these models will be then placed on the GPU memory and the larger there are, easier it is to get this out of uh, memory errors, um, which is why GPUs today are so large, like uh, our A100s, some of them have 80 gigabytes. Um, you know, when I started to do my PhD, it was normal to have a GPU of like 10 gigabytes and you were happy, you could do things, but today you are, you're never happy. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have loaded tokenizer, we have loaded um, our, our uh, model the same way we did it before. And um, I want to point this resource that you might be helpful. I point this uh, to this resource to all of my students who are starting with prompting. Uh, this is a code base by um, uh, people who have um, trained Flenty5. And as I said, they have used 1800 tasks. Uh, and they have here released the, the way they have prompted, uh, crafted these prompts for each one of these tasks. Each one of these tasks was, uh, they, they chose different prompts because they wanted to teach the model that there is a different way to instruct for the same, uh, for the same goal in mind. Um, so if you're looking for how should I prompt a model, it's good to uh, look into this, uh, this uh, code base and try to find the most similar task and then use some of their phrasings. That's a great uh, starting point for like, what, how, how should I draft my, my prompt? Um, and then specifically, if we look for SST2, we have <clears throat> these, all of these prompts. Okay. Uh, too much. All righty. So here you have examples of how to prompt for SST2. You can say review, semicolon, review. Is this movie review sentence uh, negative or positive? You might give some options like positive or negative or leave this empty. The answer is, and then whatever the answer is, should be the output. Or short movie review. Did a critic think positively or negatively of the movie? Um, sentence from a movie review. Select your answer. Was uh, the movie seen positively or negatively based on the preceding review and so on. So there is a different way you can prompt a model, the, you know, as if you are asking another person, you know, you just simply have different ways to ask this, uh, this question. So these are all of your like starting points for SST2. I took the first one and we are gonna try to prompt it with the, with the first one. 
And we are first gonna do it in a zero shot way. Um, for that, we need a few things. So um, we still need our generation config, which we are going to use when we generate. So this is a nice thing, uh, hugging face when you are having a model that supports sequence to sequence or generation, uh, you can uh, then use model.generate to start. Uh, basically in the background, you are doing the next token prediction. Uh, you don't need to implement that yourself. So you just use the generate uh, option. And here uh, you're passing generation config because in generation config are hyperparameters such as uh, the um, choice of the decoding, for example, which we know are important. I don't know exactly what's, what's used here. I just use the defaults. For this specific model, remember generation config is specific to the, to the model. I picked a random example on these lines and then I use this prompt, you see, uh, review, semicolon, or just column. Why do I say semicolon? No one corrected me. Sentence, is this movie review sentence negative or positive? The answer is. Uh, and you stop where you want the model to start generating. Sometimes I see people get confused and they actually provide the answer. And then of course, model will just repeat what you said. So make sure that you stop at the right place. That's your input. You need to, again, tokenize your input. You need to then generate what the answer could be by using model.generate. And then um, uh, there is this method, decode, because what the uh, output will first be are some integers corresponding to the vocabulary um, indices of the tokens you have generated and you actually want to display word. And you can do that with the decode or batch decode if you have more than a single example. Uh, this thing here, special skip special tokens equals true. There are special tokens like um, end, beginning of the sequence, end of sequence padding. You don't want to display those things to people. It's weird, right? They don't know what, uh, you know, S or slash S or pad is. So if you put this skip special tokens equals true, the hugging face automatically will not display this for you, which is again, nice. So we run that and out of the model, we get Okay, for something this is positive and was truly positive, and then positive, positive, um, positive, positive. So, um, and you see, I hope I did use the random one. So I'm uh, I, every time I am picking a random uh, example, let's try to break it. Well, it's real good. Okay, because I wanna give, all right. I'm defeated. Uh, so this model, as you see, we didn't fine tune it now, excuse me. We didn't fine tune it. I hope that it was clear that I reloaded the model, right? Like I used the now and I reloaded the model. It's T5 large, I didn't fine tune it. And we are um, prompting it without giving any example, things work. They work so good because the Flan T5 was actually instruction fine tune with, um, with SST2 and these other 1800 tasks. So it's not super surprising that it works so well in zero shot way because it's not actually zero shot because the SST2 data was used for instruction fine tuning. And this is important for you to remember. This becomes very finicky in uh, NLP research today. Understanding whether your data, even your training data has been used as the part of instruction fine tuning is important if you are claiming I'm getting zero shot or few shot performance because zero shot or few shot performance means that you have used only zero, either zero or few training example. And if you have used the training data for instruction fine tuning, well, then you have used the entire training set. And because the documentation of these things becomes worse and worse because now we are in the section of industry and acad academia, it's, it's, it's actually sometimes really hard. And even worse, um, it has been shown that the test sets were part of the pre-training themselves as well. So that's mega bad, right? Because then we are claiming some performance, even we don't we don't maybe claim zero shot or few shot, but you know, um, using test set for training is is uh, uh, another you know uh, no no in uh, machine learning. I mean, it defeats the point of machine learning. Like that's that's uh, then what are we even reporting then? 
So yeah, the, the, we have somewhat like a reproducibility crisis in, um, in NLP in the state of large language models, and you should be aware of those, uh, those uh, yeah, challenges. If you had now give me an example uh, here, instead of random sentence, I, you have craft a short sentence, that would be really uh, zero shot because you just made up it on, on fly and no way it's really in, in the part of the, I mean, I, I suppose if you're slightly creative, it wouldn't be a part of the instruction fine tuning. And that would be for real zero, zero shot, right? Okay, so that's how zero shot things work. Here, I did it only for a single example. You usually do this in batches, you use GPUs and so on. Maybe you need to put your uh, batch of data on device using dot to device and these kinds of things. So, you know, just note I gave you some minimal code, but it needs to be fleshed out a little bit to be like a, you know, uh, something you would actually use for a larger scale evaluation. Okay, is that clear zero shot? How we craft a prompt for zero shot uh, here, we just use one sentence as that's the sentence of the evaluation example we care about. If we want to do a few shots, so now this is where I didn't, I was not clear last time. Um, few shot learning goes beyond prompting. Few shot learning is just uh, uh, learning the task with only few training examples. But, um, and maybe I will go to my slides for that. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me skip. Like, okay. So you could do few shot learning by doing your standard fine tuning, but using only few examples. That will still be few shot learning because you have used few examples. And if you had uh, crafted your examples in a prompt like way, you would call that. Um, let me hide. Uh, if you if you've used a few examples, you would use that prompt based. Uh, you would use prompt based fine tuning, or today that's also known as instruction fine tuning. Uh, now I wanted to put here instruction fine tuning, but I do not recommend it because instruction fine tuning has been really done on a large scale during pre training, and you wouldn't be wrong if you said, "Well, this is instruction fine tuning too." You wouldn't be wrong, but you will send your other person you are saying this to in a wrong mind space, the, uh, a head space. They will think, okay, you are doing like a large scale 1800 task uh, instruction fine tuning uh, situation. So uh, you can call this prompt based fine tuning. And this would still be few shot learning. However, what I talked about last time is uh, the idea of not fine tuning the model and giving it few examples in the context. And we call this in-context learning. So in-context learning is one instance of few, few shot learning where you do not change the model weights. There is no back propagation involved. Uh, and these uh, few examples are just part of the string, part of the prompt that we are giving to the model. When we do instruction fine tuning though, we do craft examples like this, but we do back propagation. So in context learning, no fine tuning, no changing of weights, never. That's what in context learning is. Instruction fine tuning, there is word fine tuning and there is changing of weights. Uh, but we do craft examples in a similar way, which is a little bit confusing uh, for sure. Okay, so we covered what few shot learning is, what in context learning or zero shot prompting is. We have uh, seen, um, you know, alternatives to few shot learning. And maybe let's go first before we go into chain of thought prompting. I'm gonna just demo the in context learning part. So all we are doing now is uh, chain. We are we are extending our prompt. We are making the prompt such. Uh, similar to the one we have uh, uh, designed over here, uh, but we are going to put few examples, few demonstrations, few shots before we give the evaluation instance. So for that, um, first of all, you will need to find some uh, training instances. And remember, they are always shared amongst the evaluation examples. You can't, every time you are prompting a model for another evaluation example, now sample new eight examples, training examples, because then you are using way more 
training examples than you are claiming, which here is eight. So you sample your eight examples from the data, from the data, and then you want to uh, convert all of them into this um, in some way. So now, you know, when I said like there are choices of what the prompt is, you could have an instruction at the top and then just give examples without repeating the instruction. And that's what I have in my slide. But here I have a slightly different version where I'm giving instructions with every single example. And it's again a prompt. Like there is, as I said, no hard definition of the structure of the prompt. So what I'm doing here, each one of my training instances, each one of uh, eight of them will be converted in the same prompt we have seen before. Review, semicolon, review. Is this movie review sentence negative or positive? The answer is. And for the demonstrations, we are going to give the answer, actually, which needs to be transformed into a string. Don't use zero or one, because now we, then we, we don't do fine tuning. It's going to be confusing to a model. OK, so we do that. And then we have our demonstrations that are converted like this. Uh, we pick some evaluation instance. And then we also convert it in this way. Is this review review I mean, a review column review? Is this review positive, negative, blah, blah, blah. And then for every evaluation instance, you want to shuffle the order of these demonstrations. I said, and I will come back to that, that there is sensitivity of the order that the demonstrations come and you'll want your evaluation to be robust and it's going to be more robust if you are counting that there might be a favorable order so you're you're randomly changing the order and not every time you are going to hit that favorable order for the model so you're not overestimating your performance okay you we did that and now we are just uh extending the prompt string by adding our training instance input and training instance output, which is the output is just the negative or positive. So we are just constructing this uh, prompt string. At the end, we add our evaluation instances input, but not the output, of course. We want the output to be generated by the model. And we get our prompt, we tokenize it, everything else stays the, exactly the same. So we do that. And I didn't do this. And it again uh, works. But yeah, what changes is that our prompt is now more richer. It has more information. And for this specific example, where SST2 has already been used for instruction fine tuning of the model, the difference won't matter because you have seen enough of the training examples. Uh, if you do not have, if you have never seen the task, then showing demonstrations will help, especially for the model to uh, have a more constrained tokens. Uh, if you if you are doing classification, for example, you care maybe about two classes and you don't want the model to produce synonyms of those uh, phrasing. And then it's helpful to see how, um, you know, you constrain your output space in your demonstrations. Uh, not always few shot is going to work uh, better than zero shot. It's an active area of research to understand that better. There is some theory, nice theory behind it. Uh, so don't be terribly, uh, you know, scared if you see that few shot is uh, actually giving you worse performance than zero shot. But often it will. So uh, it's not like an end of the world if you don't see the benefits, but uh, it's definitely worth it to try. Yes, please. Uh, once we selected demonstration examples, uh -huh. uh, are they fixed or uh, like for different evaluation examples? Yeah, keep the same demonstration. Yeah, that's very important to keep the the same demonstrations. Now we also know that there is sensitivity to the choice of demonstrations. So how to do our evaluation more robust? What we typically do is repeat our evaluation a few times, three to five times, uh, where we choose uh, three, uh, the different sets of eight examples. And you will get in the end uh, three to five accuracies and you will average them and then report the average accuracy and the variance. Yeah, which is, yeah, I will I will show you a few papers that propose even better approaches, but then, you know, it requires having um, more GPUs. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, how to, how to pre present these results robustly is definitely a challenge. And yeah, there are papers to this day that talk about this. So it's not like we have we have now a great proposal everyone agrees with. 
Okay, so this is how we did our in-context learning. And again, remember there were no fine tuning was involved. I was just doing the inference out of the model. We have talked about chain of thought prompting. I won't demo it, but it's basically very alike um, in context learning where your prompt is just different. Here you would have let's think step by step explanation. So the answer is. So basically, here when I draft these instances, um, here I would have let's uh, think step by step explanation. And then uh, the answer is, so the answer is. That's the only thing that would change. Okay. And here you would stop on, um, when you have evaluation instance, yeah, you need to be a little bit more careful because you don't can't assume you have explanation for your uh, evaluation instance. So you would stop after listing step-by-step -step period, and then you just need to craft your examples in a way that you give explanations for demonstrations, but not for the evaluation instance. All righty, so where are we? That's chain of thought prompting. As I said, um, this is what uh, we do. We take someone's instruction fine-tuned model, and we do in-context learning and zero-shot prompting. Uh, but someone had uh, did this instruction fine tuning stage. So uh, we have um, uh, um, a Flenty 5 as example that we have just used. And they have, as I showed you in their code base, crafted all of these uh, instances in a way that's more like instructing the model rather than just giving the sentence. Remember when we did pure fine tuning, we didn't do, we just gave the sentence, right? There was nothing else we prepended to this uh, sentence. And some of these examples include chain of thoughts. There is also something self called self-consistency that I will uh, skip. And um, they also sometimes, not always, uh, produce these in-context learning-alike examples to kind of induce in-context learning abilities of the model later on. In terms of the task, I said they use 1800 tasks, which is, I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing um, that yeah, it, it, there are layers of mind blowing to me here. First of all, that the NLP community had produced 1,800 tasks, data sets. I mean, that's a lot, right? Uh, and they, they are quite varied. They spend all sorts of, uh, you know, abilities. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the amount of label data here. It's really wild because, you know, people have been doing... Um, before pre-training kickoff, a lot of people were doing like multitask learning, but you would use like five tasks and be like, oh, there might be some catastrophic forgetting, uh, you know, super scared what will happen with your five tasks. And here they're using 1800 and, you know, it didn't all fall apart, which is of course um, due to people who are involved being uh, excellent engineers uh, as well. Okay, so now that our context is becoming lo longer, right? We want to fit a few instructions. Uh, we want to fit an instruction. We want to fit few demonstrations. What if the demonstration is a summarization? We have a very long document and we want to summarize it. We know we can fit only, you know, with open source models, 2,000 or 4,000 tokens. That's not really a lot. You can't put a lot of demonstrations there. If you're happy, if your article is really long, like, scientific article, for example, there is a task, a, a claim verification uh, in scientific uh, articles. You need to give a full paper from archive and I give you a statement and the model needs to say whether this statement is true or false. Now, I, if I fit one of these in this limited context is gonna be great. Um, so what uh, what people are you know are now also uh, doing is called a retrieval augmented uh, generation. Um, and let me see, I do have uh, an illustration of that, which is great. Okay. So you have your standard indexing of your data. You know, if you have taken any data mining or data science course, you probably uh, know uh, something uh, about it. So you have your collection of documents and they are indexed somehow and you can uh, retrieve them. And uh, with retrieval argument, uh, argumented generation, what you are doing is you have a query from a person like um, a, a very alike a Google search, like someone asks something. And then in the background, we are finding 
uh, doing vector similarity to see what kind of document is the most relevant for this query. And then uh, this query is given to the context of the model and, uh, and then the model generates the answer like before. So we are kind of finding, we are not trying to put a lot of things in the context because we are like, ah, we don't know what's the important for the model. Rather, we are trying to find the thing that's, uh, that is we important to the model. Um, yeah, and um, with this, we are also uh, forcing the model to ground its generation in a information that's truly relevant. So this um, problem that this model uh, have called hallucination, where the model produces facts that are um, not correct or entities that do not exist in the real world can be circumvented to some extent because we are forcing the model to generate in the context of something real and relevant for the information. Um, it's still a very active area of research. Um, um, one problem that I want to kind of highlight that was published last year is that these models, um, you, you can find an article, let's say Wikipedia article, you put it in the context, but these models prefer information that's in the beginning of the article uh, and, or at the end of the article. What's in the middle, it's kind of uh, becoming ignored. So there is this um, bias these models have. And if you're really important information in the middle, is in the middle, you might not be preventing this issue you wanted to prevent uh, where the model you know, starts to generate things that are not factually correct. So yeah, how to optimize the context length and context construction. Like context construction refers to what do you put in the context? Uh, these are two very, very active uh, area of research today. And then, as I said, whenever a new language model is released, one of the like currencies is how long is the context? That's an important piece of information. And a lot of companies today are built on this idea of retrieval augmented generation, like u.com, which is kind of like an alternative to both ChatGPT and uh, Google search or other search engines for searching information is uh, is based on these principles. Lots of startups, it, it is one of these things that people realize, okay, it's one way to circumvent this hallucination problem, which is one of the biggest bottlenecks for the um, you know, uh, usage of large language models uh, uh, in the world. Okay, I mean, there is so much to talk about this. I, it could be a whole course on its own. So I'm gonna move forward uh, because we wanna talk about a few more things. Okay, I wanna talk about too many things. That's the issue. So uh, let me see, what else did I prepare? Why? All righty. Um, I already touched on the topic of reliable few shot, um, few shot, uh, eval few shot learning evaluation, and we talked about that there is sensitivity to choice of few examples, and there is no sensitivity to choice. Uh, I didn't talk about this. There is no sensitivity to choice of labels, and then there are poor experimental practices. So. Um, Eric has wonderful slides for their paper that had kind of warned about this sensitivity to uh, to the choice of uh, ex uh, to the choice of uh, examples. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I kind of already mentioned this. Uh, these are the plots that provide the evidence for that. Um, here uh, is the. Um, um, I'm trying to see how to. Yeah, so what you're looking at this plot is you can ignore the blue lines that's their proposal for how to circumvent some of these things. When you look at the red lines, uh, these uh, you know colored areas, they present how much variation there is from the choice of the uh, uh, examples. So on average, we get accuracy of 60, but depending on, on your choice, you can get only 50% accuracy or over 70%. So you can totally underestimate or overestimate your performance depending on the choice of uh, of examples that you are picking for this in context learning. So uh, we won't go into details of how they circumvent this, but this is important to realize this huge variation, right? That's, that's what you're looking at in these plots. And even with their proposal, you still have variation here, right? It's not 
it's not like this was fixed in 2021. This was um, highlighted for GPT-3 in specifically. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, so their whole idea, how they fix this, uh, just quickly to give you a high level um, impression is that they realize that when you give the content free uh, prompt to a model, meaning you don't give it actual text, you, you just give it uh, unknown or NA, something that just nothing, right? And you ask it for the sentiment, it will give you, uh, when you do this enough times, what you should be getting for two labels is 50% accuracy, right? But what the model is is getting is uh, 62, uh, uh, it, excuse me, what they shouldn't, it, the model shouldn't get, be getting the accuracy of 50%. I mean, it's likely is be having a random model, but it should assign positive and negative equally, right? Because they are equally possible. However, it is more prone to say that the uh, this content-free prompt is positive. So it has bias to producing positive, which comes probably from the distribution of the pre-training data. The word positive was seen more than negative and therefore the model uh, spits out positive more. Um, and what they say is due to this, we will have uh, these kinds of sensitivities. Uh, so we can correct this by tweaking the output metrics such as um, uh, that these two options, two labels are um, selected by a model for a content-free prompt uh, equally. So they are just changing the output metrics and then they are, instead of getting 62% uh, positive for the content-free prompt, they are getting 50%. And as we have seen on these slides that work to some extent, uh, and it actually gives you better performance with a smaller number of, uh, of uh, 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 examples, but there is still variation, right? It's uh, That's why we do repeat these experiments a few times, as I said. Now, uh, this is one of the papers I uh, bring up probably way too often, but this is a very intriguing result. So in this paper, they show that there is actually no sensitivity to uh, the labels you are giving to your demonstrations. So logical thing to do is you have your label training examples and you give the label that actually is the label for that example. Well, this paper shows if you just randomly pick a label, your in-context learning might still work really well. Specifically here in the blue bar, you have, um, you have zero shot prompting baseline. So you are not giving any demonstrations. In the uh, orange lines, second bars, you are getting a few shot in context learning uh, performance. So the thing I have them with you. In the red, you are getting performance of uh, giving the same number of demonstrations, the same demonstrations you have used, but instead of giving their actual labels, you just randomly pick one. And here, the performance is for certain models is uh, is almost the same as if you give actual actual um, labels, which is kind of mind blowing, right? That why would that be the case? Like in the end here, you are still this red bar here is still then zero shot prompting performance, despite you giving some inputs, because we can also always find some inputs, more inputs from the like the evaluation instance, there's just so much unlabeled data on the web, that's not gonna be a problem, right? Or manually crafting eight examples, like you can do that very quickly on your own. So in this, this bars, despite our giving some inputs, if we just randomly slap the labels, they're not labeled examples, and therefore this is still a zero shot performance to some extent. So yeah, this is very intriguing that you can do this, that you can get this like from 40 to 60%, you know, like 20% boost just by giving some inputs of the uh, of the task. And they, they present this very, you know, interesting idea that the, the, I will read it out loud. The model performs in downstream's task without relying on the input label cor correspondence from the demonstrations. This suggests that the model has learned the implicit notion of input label correspondence from the language modeling objective alone. For example, associating a positive review with the word positive. 
This is in line with Reynolds and McDonald, who claim that the demonstrations are for task location and the intrinsic ability to perform the task uh, is obtained at the pre-training time, time. So the idea is that during pre-training, the model has learned to solve the task. But if you just prompt it uh, without any, any inputs, um, like the evaluation instance, um, it can't localize the task in its, uh, you know, space of its solutions. And you don't need to give it input, uh, output, or like labeled examples uh, for it to localize this task it has learned. You just need to give it inputs. Um, it ju by just giving the uh, similar distribution of the text of the that you are interested in, it kind of reminds itself of the task. Together with the, uh, we did mention some labels. They are randomly assigned, but we didn't mention it. So it also learns, aha, uh -huh, the output space is this set. I don't know the correspondence between inputs and outputs, but I learned that positive, negative is what, either positive or negative is what I should be outputting. Uh, and that's enough for me to be reminded of where I like what I know about this task. So it's a very interesting, very intriguing uh, result. It had like led to a bunch of discussion, uh, uh, you know, bunch of follow ups uh, that might explain this more, more, you know, in a more principled way. Yeah. yeah. So what if we like introduce a third of classification, it's like positive? Oh yeah, so they have a bunch of, uh, uh, so these classification results, I don't think they are just positive or negative, but they also have multiple choice question answering where you have a couple of choices, usually four choices. So uh, in these cases, yeah, also you can see it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. What difference between the white hats, the F1 and the first result? Yeah. Accuracy and F1 are two uh, measurements for evaluation of accuracy. F1 make, measures precision and recall and takes the um, you know, combination of two of them. F1 is usually more robust if you don't have balanced data sets. How do you divide them? Can we just check them? Is that the same thing? Or... Accuracy and F1 are not the same thing, no. But they are trying to measure something similar. It, it's a, just an evaluation. How do we compare? Them, the and the oh, you are not doing that. Okay. You will never do that. Like we are never comparing the absolute values of um, tasks, even if they are classification tasks, we won't be really. I mean, here they do provide averages, mm -hmm. but uh, you are not comparing. I, I don't know if I get 80% on sentiment classification in SST, I don't compare that to 70% accuracy in AG news. You know, you always need to compare apples to apples. Same task, same data, same evaluation measurement. Yeah, so we just don't do these comparisons. That's not interesting anyway. For us, interesting um, is to compare these three bars for for each one of the group of three bars. Yeah, so that's what we are comparing. In the end, we want to see that this is not a property. Why they do this for classification and multiple choice and three uh, models is to show that these uh, results generalize from, you know, across tasks and um, and models. Yeah. So I could have shown you just this to make the point, but yeah, I showed everything. Okay, so there's that. It's, it's a, in, an intriguing result. And then uh, there is a lot of poor experimental practices, at least when fronting has started in 2020. I think pe people are better now, but what would happen, people will say, okay, I'm gonna use only a few training examples, but then to find hyperparameters, they use the entire development set. Is that really few shot then? If you're doing model selections with thousands of instances, not really, but just because you know, few shot has been described as only you use few training examples, people somehow mentally forget that Okay, but I shouldn't be using, you know, choosing models uh, uh, by ton of example either. Uh, and then, I'll, you know, I have shown you that we should have, we have all these kinds of sensitivities for a while using like a single seed, same order, not repeating across different choices was a thing. So here are two papers that talk about what are better practices for few shot uh, evaluation. And, you know, these days, because 
this become more, you know, mainstream thing, uh, I don't see this become, you know, still being a huge issue. People are, are aware that they should be doing uh, robust, more robust evaluations, but, you know, they are in the field and you're just starting. So uh, just have that in mind too. There is ton more, there is this huge survey. So uh, if you if you want to learn more, I recommend checking checking it out. Okay, are there any questions about the content so far? If not, we're going to move to RLA Jeff. Okay. All right. So let's talk about RLA Jeff. Uh, just going, you know, going step back reminding ourselves what are we doing, what are we talking about? We are talking about these new pre-training stages that kind of led to these latest and greatest large language models. And now we are entering 2023, era where this idea of human um, learning, human feedback, uh, integrating human preferences into pre-training, one of these pre-training stages uh, is uh, going to be helpful. And this is kind of RLHF has not been proposed last year, you know, it's been a while since RLHF has been uh, proposed, proposed, which stands for re, um, reinforcement learning um, in human from human feedback. Well, I forgot that for a second. Um, uh, it has been, of course, proposed before and learning from pairwise preferences was something that, especially in RL and robotics world, was, uh, was around. So it's kind of a technique that was brought for these uh, LLMs. And uh, why why do why was why is RLHF so important? So uh, before we had RLHF uh, and both your base and instruct versions of your models, uh, they do have ton of biases and uh, they have tendency if you prime them to say something nasty, they are certainly going to say something nasty. Um, and RLHF is the way to prevent this. So. For example, in 2016, there has been a chatbot that was released uh, by Microsoft uh, called Tay, and then Tay had to be shut down in a matter of a day because uh, it started to say uh, awful, awful things. And uh, that it makes no sense to have a chatbot that is just, uh, you know, hateful uh, and uh, terrible, uh, you know, to engage with people. And, you know, like uh, the idea of chatbot was always like, you don't want to do a chatbot, I mean, release it to everyone because it's going to do one of these uh, terrible, terrible things. So reinforcement learning from human feedback is one now when it was integrated as one of these pre-training stages is what started to, it, what is what prevents the these models to now spiral is to say all of these things. I will present you a very high level overview of what, how RLHF works. It requires that you know a little bit not a little bit, but that you know uh, reinforcement learning and uh, market decision processes if uh, you really want to understand it, which is maybe uh, not at the level we are all at right now. So we are just going to go over the uh, general idea. So first step is to do instruction fine tuning. So uh, right now it, we learned that that's a thing to do, so whatever, but um, it hasn't been for a while a thing to do, so it's it, it was important to emphasize you should do this uh, instruction fine tuning stage. So you get some prompts, you get um, whatever should be desired output here. Like if you have a prompt summarize this article, we would use human written summary. And then you are going to fine tune your model of a choice with this uh, data in a supervised way. Instructional fine tuning, that, that's what this uh, is. Um, a version of this model, instruction fine tune that you are going to then RLHF is called SFT, which stands for supervised fine tuning. Okay. So SFT, when you see SFT version of a model, for you in your head, that's instruction fine tuned version of a model. That's the first step. Without this step, the model doesn't have abilities to follow instructions and then RLHF is doomed because it doesn't have a good starting point. So SFT is necessity for RLHF. And now you are going to collect some preferences. You are going to have your prompt. Um, you are going to generate, uh, you know, we have learned about different decoding strategies. So we know we can tweak um, these hyperparameters and get 
different outputs depending on which hyperparameters we use, right? Um, especially if you use nucleus or other sample strategies, then even with the same hyperparameters, we get different uh, generations. So we get four or however many we want generations out of the same SFT model. And we ask some person, a human annotator, annotator to provide the ranking between these or to provide preferences between pairs of these. So a person tells you, I like this output more than this one. And today with the current large language models such as Llama 2 or ChatGPT, uh, you may, might ask them to tell you which they preferred according to specific properties such as healthfulness. Which one of the outputs was more helpful, this one or this one? Or you might ask them which one of these um, outputs is more safe if we consider the definition of safety to be um, according to the law and not uh, uh, projecting any uh, hate speech and so on. And you know you get your preferences, you collect your preference data. And now you get into the reinforcement learning part. Uh, for reinforcement learning, you need to, a uh, couple of things, but important terms here is our policy. That's the model you are trying to RLHF. And for us, that's the large language model we want to produce at the end. Uh, in RL, there is always like you have a state and then action, right? For us, action is taking the next, making the next token prediction, and your state is whatever you are current, you know, like current generated sequences together with your. You have your prompt, and you have some generated tokens. Whatever you have generated so far, that's your state. And when you make an action, meaning next token prediction, you're getting to another state, which is just a one token longer sequence. So that's your policy. And for reinforcement learning, you also need a reward function, which tells you, given your current generation, once you're done or at the, at the stage of generating, um, how good that generation uh, is. Um, in NLP, in our large language models, we use these offline rewards. Uh, once, you know, um, where if we are kind of taking already if you are doing a RLHF ourselves, meaning we train it as just a model, like separate model, and now this model can produce some scores for rewards, and then we use it as as a during the reinforcement learning where we change our policy, but we don't change the reward. So it's kind of it stays the fix, which means that's offline. Um, okay, so yeah, so basically we have our prompt. Uh, our policy, which is large language model, generates whatever it generates. And then that generation is passed to the reward model. The reward says, I am, I think it's fine-ish. And then, which is like from zero or one, maybe a score 0.6. And then that information is given back to the uh, policy and the, the parameters are changed accordingly, which of course, I'm not telling you how exactly they are changed and how all of this works because we don't want to get into those details, uh, but that's the high level uh, idea. Unlike your, you know, um, here you can get negative like a uh, signal that that's not really good, which is the strongest signal than when you get from your supervised fine tuning. Uh, also, what is good or not, there is a spectrum and with uh, supervised things, you, you kind of have very crude ways of saying this is good or bad, but you don't have ability to say like, yeah, could be better, you know, or something, or send, send a more uh, softer signal. And some of these things in NLP particularly like, you know, are slightly also subjective, which is very hard to model with supervised way, but you can uh, you can, you know, these slight preferences can be integrated into the RLHF. Questions about this? So we have instruction fine tuning SFT, we collect preference data. Today, we are not ourselves collecting. There are preferences data sets that you use like from Hugging Face data sets, and then you do RLHF. Most often you don't do RLHF in yourself, you use RLHF model, which will be usually denoted as chat. So let's say Lama 2 base and then Lama 2 chat is the RLHF version. Um, I think this is what kind of gave a huge uh, step ahead to OpenAI, this part here, 
when they released GPT-3 uh, paper and they had this nice playground where people, especially researchers, were playing around, they have collected a ton of these data. And then they do have, they had to hire actual annotators, uh, which unfortunately they did um, in uh, far locations and pay people really small money. But they did get these preferences and then they were able to do the uh, RLHF uh, way before anyone else could. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, you probably have contributed to, to, uh, to this if you have used um, open AI services in 2020, 2021. Okay, now I did say we are gonna stop models from doing this to going rogue, right? Uh, what exactly here prevented, you know, going rogue? Uh, what prevented is uh, this idea of red teaming. So uh, when, you know, these organizations, they are, um, they train their base and instruct versions of their models. Uh, what they then do is red teaming. They hire some people and they ask these people, make our model, try to make our model say outrageous things. Try to make this model uh, be bad. Like try to break it in any way you can. And uh, once you break it, also uh, provide how would be, what would be the better way to respond to this thing? So they find all of these weak points of the models, uh, you know, um, upsetting user experience, experiences, enabling harm by aiding violence, enabling other unlawful uh, activities and so on. Uh, they find how better the model could be. And then they um, use that corrected version as the preferred version. So when they do RLHF, those you know corrected versions will be here taught to the model that that that's how you know uh, you should have responded uh, instead. Uh, so if you know if you get from ChatGPT, I cannot answer this because blah blah blah. That was the that that's where this come from or very very too polite kind of way of answering. That's where this comes from. It all comes from people who said ah oh, you could have responded like this if you really, really want to be polite and never say anything slightly wrong. Okay, and this is basically what large language models are today. Like, that's it. Like, we have our Llama 2 is, uh, as I mentioned before, an open source uh, model that was released last year that's kind of begin this another, you know, um, gave um, another amount of energy for people to try to you know produce open source versions of uh, GPT-4. Um, and it has these three steps we have talked about. First of all, it has, uh, and you know, again, because all of these terms are pretty new, you will see uh, different terminologies. I refer to all of these as three stages of pre-training. Um, here they will call uh, the pre-training, the say, stage where we do next token prediction. Um, I didn't mention maybe before, but that's called also self-supervised training because um, it's supervised because in the end we do have, we assume that whatever came next in text is our human uh, gold label. So it's supervised, but supervision didn't come by human labeling the data and therefore it's self-supervised. So that's that's the first stage. Then it comes our our um, supervised fine tuning here, which we call the instruction fine tuning or SFT. And then you have RLHF, um, rejection sampling and PPO, proximal policy optimizations are ingredients of RL reinforcement learning. You need to actually do RLHF, which we didn't talk about. But here is what we talked about. You have this human preference data. The model generates a few things, and then you ask person, hey, um, amongst these uh, outputs, which one is more safe? And uh, amongst these two outputs, which one is more helpful? And then you uh, teach the model that it should produce the data that's more preferred by people. So three stages of pre-training we have seen. That's, uh, that's, um, that's what we have today. Maybe next year, when I teach this course again, We'll have another thing that we slap onto this thing, but this is the current uh, situation. Um, what else did I wanna say? Yeah, and you know, um, OpenAI did this uh, uh, RLHF thing and then their chat chatbot finally, it was the first chatbot that actually worked to some extent. Not only worked like giving you, helping you, but also not needing to be a PR disaster and then shut down immediately. It was the first time this 
this idea of that check, helpful chatbot might exist uh, became, became uh, realized. So in that sense, RLHF is uh, incredibly useful. Now, remember what I told you when we talked about the difference of, hey, should I use BERT-like model for classification or T5 and do sequence to sequence? Um, you know, using BERT was, I said, fine. And you as well could still use the base version of these latest and greatest pre-trained models. Uh, like Mistral is a good example. Uh, their mo base model, which is not instruction fine-tuned or RLHF or the, of the version that's just instruction fine-tuned, but it's not RLHF. If you try, it will still spit out bad things if you if you make it to do that. But it's a great model, great base to start fine tuning your model for classification. And if you care just about your specialized classification task, you do not necessarily need RLHF version. RLHF is about uh, generation. It is about uh, models that will, people will interact. A lot of people will interact with these models and. It's, uh, I said it's about generation because uh, these preferences will then enable better generation abilities, especially in terms of creative writing or uh, you know larger pieces pieces of text. For sure, this this is helpful, but it's not like every application uh, needs that. So don't think okay, I need everything here to have a successful application. Really contextualize it in what you want to do. But these pre-trained, latest pre-trained model, their base version is usually better than non of models we had a couple of years back. So um, if you are deciding, I don't need really instruction fine-tuned model or RLHF model, you still want, might want to use LAMA to base as your fine-tuning um, model. Okay, so I want to talk about some challenges, open challenges with RLHF. Uh, are there any questions in terms of this, what you're seeing, this, how, like, how did, does this work? And I maybe didn't emphasize enough, we don't really know what goes into the chat GPT. We do have, a, like, you know, some technical report, which is um, lots of details are omitted, but it's something like this as well, right? So when you think about chat GPT, again, think about this kind of setup, it's likely uh, very, 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 um, there, there aren't like a huge no, new component we don't know about for sure. And these latest models like ChatGPT, they are also multimodal models. So we are done doing this only for text. We are also doing this with, you know, images and these days audio as well and, and other things. Um, maybe one more thing I want you to remember is, you know, when I said some people, especially in like pop side, they will say, oh, these models learned all of these things out of nowhere, you know, just from this um, data that was on the web. And you should remember that G GPT-3 had only this component and it could not do any of these things we are excited about. It was really, you know, it was great at the time. Of course, it was magnificent and like everyone's minds were blown, but relative to GPT-4 and chat GPT, it was it's like incredibly bad, right? It's like so, so, so bad. Um, everything here is very, uh, there is so much human supervision from this like ton of human uh, instruction fine tuning data to ton of human preferences. So these things didn't just emerge from nowhere. They really came from human uh, supervision. So have that in mind that when someone is like, oh, these ro LLM robots learned everything gonna kill us, you tell them, listen, there are some lots of human supervision here and you know we teach them a lot of things. Okay, so in terms of open challenges. So RLHF last year happened, become mainstream, huge thing of obviously so many open questions. So if you're excited about doing some you know, NLP research, there are so many, uh, so many things to do over here. So first thing that uh, that people kind of, uh, you know, uh, emphasized is that um, the reinforcement learning part might not be necessary for RLHF and LLMs, meaning you can turn this preference data in some way and use um, a, a particular training objective, supervised training objective that's the, that doesn't require any reinforcement learning. And, uh, and this, objective that you have produced is principled. It came, it was derived from the preferences objectives we have used for RLHF. 
uh, and you will be able to uh, to learn from these preferences as, as good as you did with the RLHF. Meaning there is this question of, do we really need reinforcement learning to learn from human preferences? Um, I think the kind of the, from, you know, what I hear from people who I, I know is that you might get these uh, DPO kinds of uh, non-RL um, algorithms to work when your preference data, when everything, the whole environment is static as it is currently with text. But if you're trying to learn things on fly in, in proper terminologies online, if you have online rewards, re uh, environment that changes, then this might not be sufficient and you might need reinforcement learning. So there is a lot of proposals and lots of papers that are coming out. Like we have an algorithm where that's, you know, as uh, good or better than your uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, but it's simpler and you can, you know, learn the same thing more easily. Um, it Don't conclude that that means that reinforcement learning is truly not necessary. It's maybe not necessary in this current setup we work in. There's a lot of questions about whose preference is human preference, right? Like if I now give you some text and I ask all of you, uh, you know, your preference, and if I am intentionally choosing these preferences to be, you know, uh, provocative, more maybe on the axis of cultures or religions or political leanings, I will get a ton of different preferences, right? Uh, hopefully. And, and, you know, that then that raises a question of uh, what are we actually modeling, right? Um, then there is the question of how to balance multiple preferences. We have, I told you about uh, helpful and honest. Some of these models also have harmless. Uh, sorry, I talked about helpful and safety. I guess safety is harmless. I didn't really talk about uh, honest. There is this um, pro pro uh, property called uh, psychopathy, I think, or something like that, where the model will, if you will, give you outputs that it uh, deems you will agree with like you know it kind of um gets what you uh what you want to hear and therefore produces text that will make you happy because it was taught to make uh you know uh, to be helpful to you um so you also want the models to be honest like for example if you have um someone who believes certain conspiracy theory which is untrue um which i probably shouldn't give any example of uh and then the the you know the the person puts this uh, uh, idea into the chatbot, and chatbot says, "Yeah, yeah, that that hundred percent true. You know, uh, that's that's yeah, you are right. We don't want these chatbots to do that because that has negative uh, societal uh, consequences, right? Um, so that's why the honesty was also introduced. So, uh, sorry, I kind of got into honesty. I felt like I have so much more to say there, but. Uh, how do we balance all of these uh, different rewards? You know, um, you can make your model extremely harmless if it always rejects saying anything, right? Like if it's always, I cannot help you with that, that might lead to negative consequences, but that would hardly be a helpful model, right? And and you might encounter that yourself and you're like, just say what this thing is, right? Like, I don't need this all this fluff around it. So that's still very active area of research, like how do we actually find, like, um, you know, computationally, what kind of training objectives and algorithms should we have to kind of produce this kind of balances? Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, um, more conceptual question. So do we want AI that takes a stand or do we want AI that shies away from any potential controversial topics? Like what do we want these chatbots to do like what are the societal, uh, you know, consequences? Not necessarily negative, maybe positive that we wanna wanna see. Um, so yeah, there is a ton of questions, and in general, for you know, we kind of now came to the end of understanding what modern large language models are. Uh, standard thing people ask me are: is there anything left to do? And there is a ton of things to to be done. Uh, I recommend that you check this. Uh, blog post by Chip, uh, and um, they have introduced these uh, different, you know, things that uh, are still open challenges. We talked briefly about, you know, optimizing context length and context const uh, construction. We talked a little bit about hallucinations 
we talked a little bit about improving learning from human preferences, but there are uh, there are many others that you might want to uh, check out. It's a it's a nicely written, you know, uh, it's a, about technical topics, but written in a way that's uh, easy easily digestible. So yeah, I will leave you with that, and then um, yeah, see you next week on Monday. We don't have class if you don't know, uh, and then we'll see each other in in a week.